So hi everybody. Uh, my name is Zirat Ben Gal. I'm happy to be here um, and uh, deliver a talk uh, on what we call Ensemble-based uh, novelty detection. Uh, it's a joint work with uh, Marcelo, a former PhD student and now a, a leading uh, team in uh, applied materials. Erez Shmueli and uh, myself. So we thought so many uh, talks here, what, how we can make it different. So we'll be a couple. Uh, in the middle, we'll change. And the next time we live in, uh, maybe Marcelo will bring a guitar and we sing a song. And by the way, he's a, he's a band player. He's not used, uh, usually he's giving, his uh, performers are in uh, small smoky bars at 2 p.m., uh, 2 a.m. in the morning, so uh, this is uh, a new venture for him. So uh, we'll talk about uh, novelty detection, what is uh, the motivation, uh, why ensemble-based models are actually working well in uh, novelty detection, uh, and then how you can do better than ensemble by introducing some uh, information theoretical uh, concepts and uh, some uh, conclusion at the end. Now, before I do so, just a small promotion. Uh, this work is part of uh, the Lambda, uh, the Laboratory of AI Machine Learning and Business Data Analytics in the Faculty of Engineering at Tel Aviv University. We are around 30 people, uh, most of them graduate students, but very important former students and people from the industry affiliated with the lab and helping to carry research that uh, involves real uh, problem from the industry, as long as it is uh, complicated enough, and uh, thanks God, uh, most of the problem are to support uh, a thesis. And uh, some of the work that we've been doing are uh, with, uh, you know, we have, you have some of those companies that we were working with last year. I gave a talk about uh, smart cities and, and mobility detection. We have work on HR analytics, uh, on uh, customer journey in healthcare, uh, on uh, explainable AI and uh, deep learning and so on. And uh, I invite you all to uh, look at the lab. And if you have anything to collaborate or you are interested, please come and talk to us. Now, uh, novelty detection is the identification of uh, new uh, data classes. So unlike uh, anomaly detection, where basically we're looking for uh, something that can be a, a result of a noise or an abnormal point in space. Here, we are talking about a new class of data that was not presented during the uh, learning stage of the models. And of course, it happens uh, all around us. Uh, you can have it in an online system. You have a, a new set of users that are using the system in a different way. You can think about, of course, cybersecurity, zero day attacks. You can think about industrial setting where suddenly you have a, a new problem in the line and so on. And, and this is one of the problems uh, that we'll be discussing. We'll talk about, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles that are facing new challenges. You know, can talk about communication system. Uh, there are very basic uh, problems. Uh, in a way, uh, the fact that uh, it's uh, a novelty class makes the problem, uh, in a way, easier if you know to take advantage of the fact that all those uh, sporadic points has some kind of connection between themselves, some somehow correlated. Sometimes it's very hard to find where in space they are correlated, but the fact that it's not a random noise provides you a, a, a meaningful way uh, to look after those novelties. And this is exactly what uh, we've been doing. Uh, we work both with uh, uh, data sets, public data sets, but also um, a, a data set of, uh, uh, can I say the name? Uh, okay, of applied materials where Marcelo is now working. Uh, that, as you can imagine, in, uh, in the semiconductor, when we talk about dye, it's a very complex process, a multi-product, uh, and uh, uh, we have a different mode of operations. If you look at the data, it's uh, really challenging. You have uh, multiple sources of, uh, of those features. They come from uh, different sensor and metrology devices. You can talk about 
uh, the fact that it's high dimensional data that is sparse, um, multi modes, as I mentioned before, different operating uh, modes uh, where the, uh, some of the product are rerouted back to the machines. Uh, it's non parametric, so you cannot assume uh, a nice mixture of Gaussian models and it will work. It doesn't work like that. Uh, there is a lot of uh, missing, noising, and overlapping data. I'll, I'll show you in a moment. And again, in this environment, what we're looking for is uh, those type of novelties. Where is the, whoops. The, the novelties in this case, if you can see, you have A, B, and C. So A, B, and C are uh, 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 the known classes, and suddenly you have this new class that is hidden somewhere in the, in the space and you need to find it. Now, if you want to look at the data just to understand how challenging it is, what you see here is, uh, you know, on a two dimension, a, a Mahalanobis distance between a, tar a target class and the rest of the class. So it's uh, one against all uh, cases. So what you see, Marcelo, do you have this pointer? Uh-huh. So, but, but you don't see any, do you see it? Do we have anything? Uh, yeah, I does, no, cannot see that. Okay, so what you see here, I mean, the blue, the blue dots represent the target class, and the red dots represent all the other classes. And what you see in this uh, two-dimensional uh, distance, uh, uh, a whiting distance process is uh, on the y-axis, uh, the, the distance from the class, from the target class to itself, while, uh, so sorry, to, the, uh, to all the other classes, and on the uh, x-axis, you see the distance uh, uh, from, uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to the target class. So, uh, for example, in, the in, in, in your left side, what you see is that you have a good separation. All the, indeed, all those blue points are much closer to another point in their class, but uh, and, and, and far enough from all the other classes. So you can actually find a good separation uh, among them. On the right side, you see a, a more, uh, you know, realistic case when those classes, when the, when the target class is quite close to the others. But even with the good example, what you see as the, those black dots are the novelties. So these are, this is a new class based on some new contamination in the process. And you can see that even if you have a good, very good mechanism to uh, uh, separate uh, uh, you know, the target blue class from, the, from all the others, when you introduce those novelties in the space, they are really all over. They are overlapping with existing a class and it's very hard to, uh, to distinguish them from, uh, from uh, the case. So even if you have a very good learning mechanism based on all the known data, Novelty can be actually a, a, you know, a, a pain uh, uh, when, when you have such a case. And if you take just you know, a conventional uh, multivariate process, what you see on the left side, it's a, a T. Hocklin plus PCA. So it's uh, one of the methods used to represent complex uh, interrelated classes. And what you see is uh, as the, the black line uh, over there, represent the novelty, the point where the novelty is introduced. And it's very hard, very hard, although we did uh, these component analysis and, uh, and, and follow the method to, to, to see a change point. So uh, it's very hard based on those uh, techniques to see that something changed when you have this uh, vertical black line. And the only way to find the novelty up to a certain level is to uh, uh, obtain a, a type one error of 30%. So if you obtain a type one error of 30%, so you have uh, you know, false positive, really high rate of false positive, you'll, you'll get to see uh, some of the novelties. And of course, it's impractical in those situations. And in fact, when you look at the literature and you see that most of the uh, models assume that the, nice is, uh, that the data is nicely, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, nicely distributed uh, uh, with many uh, assumptions that doesn't exist in reality, you find out that many of the, those methods actually do not work well in such a case. And uh, 
the benchmark method that we selected as the best method, uh, you know, are either based on uh, 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 the composition and kerneling or uh, Gaussian mix models or uh, based on monitoring statistics uh, and so on. Some uh, uh, Park and Wang are based on uh, an optimal procedure that works as long as uh, you have uh, most of the information at the learning stage and so on. Uh, and we'll talk more about those benchmarks, but they really are uh, um, working uh, um, um, partially when you talk about those complicated models. So if we want to talk about the model itself uh, and how we treat it, uh, you can think about uh, samples. Um, again, in this case, taken from, uh, 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 from the line based on metrology and most of it based on... Uh, you know, uh, image processing, uh, KPI, based KPI. Uh, so I think that we have around 120 or 200 of such KPIs. And for each one of them, you have uh, a mode that can represent the mode of the operation or whether or not there is a contamination and so on. And, and what you want to do is to uh, maximize the, F, uh, the estimated F1 square based on the data that you have. And the way to do it is actually by uh, working with uh, uh, those S's, those subclasses. And the reason is, as I mentioned in the beginning, the motivation is that when you talk about a new class, usually it is well correlated in some subspace. So you want to find a subspace where you can actually uh, distinguish this new class from the others. Okay? So... The motivation is clear, and what we do, I mean, the first thing is to apply a sort of a ensemble-based boosting. So you take the data, uh, and you do some random k-fold split. It's, it's, it's without repetition in, 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 the, in a way because you want to create, eventually, a matrix of all those principal components that actually covers all, those, uh, uh, all, those, all the dimension. So you, in each iteration, uh, you have a, oops, in each iteration you have a PCA, uh, and gradually when you, uh, when you uh, uh, have this uh, PCA, you construct for each iteration uh, this uh, uh, um, uh, principal component matrix, and uh, you use it with uh, any model. We used CART, uh, but you can use any model in this scheme uh, to come uh, uh, with a joint basin perspective uh, posterior probability uh, to indicate whether or not uh, the new uh, point is an, a novelty or it belongs to one of the known one of the known classes that uh, were uh, were there were when we learned the system uh, and this was the first thing that we did uh, the innovation here is basically uh, related to the way that you uh, reconstruct this diagonal matrix based on all the PCs and how you actually joined all those cards to uh, uh, obtain based on uh, you know, a rule-based, uh, an SPC rule-based case to construct a combination of this joint probability distribution. And we'll show you how it works with, uh, uh, with uh, 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 respect to uh, just regular uh, um, regular ensemble uh, monitoring. So uh, this is again, as I mentioned, the process and based on all those models, you, you obtain uh, uh, the posterior probability distribution of the classes and you take into account uh, different uh, uh, sizes of the classes and a gate function by a sigmoid and so on. Now, uh, when you apply to real data and uh, and what we did, we took uh, various data set, both from uh, applied materials, real data set, and from uh, uh, known uh, repositories. Uh, most of them were high dimensional, uh, that include noisy and sparse and missing data. Uh, again, all those assumptions that I gave before. And what we did, in many cases, we took a minority class from the from the learning stage, and we uh, we took it off, so the mechanism cannot. The learning cannot based on, on this class, and then we only introduce this new class in the testing phase. This is the way that uh, we tested ourselves, and 
Basically, uh, when you look at uh, uh, our uh, method, the uh, ensemble-based SPC to the left side, you see that in most cases we achieve um, a much better F1 score uh, than other non-ensemble methods. So this is a, a comparison, again, uh, with respect to uh, Gaussian mixed models and uh, minimum volume set and, and basin monitoring schemes and so on. Uh, so in most of the cases, it obtains a, a, a better results. And when you actually compare it to ensemble-based models that are more time-consuming, uh, uh, even here you see that the way that uh, those uh, components are combined provide a, a good result. Now, uh, before I pass it to Marcelo to explain what, is, what was the next uh, step in this algorithm, uh, uh, I want to just to explain the motivation. So this was the scheme that I presented before, and it was based on uh, the random selection of those subspaces. But as we understand, we want to find subspaces where those novelties are correlated. It means that although also those subspaces are not random. Of course, a random mechanism can work well up to some point, but is there a way to, to replace this uh, random selection by a more uh, schematic and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, organized way? And uh, uh, this uh, organized way is based on, on the characteristic that we want to find for those subspaces. And we, we want to find subspaces. You see these three examples with uh, you know, the green V where actually those uh, points that are related to the novelties are actually well separated from a correlated, from a space of correlated uh, 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 observations. So what you need to find is a set of features that are somehow correlated to each other. They are not identical because then you don't add any information to it, but somehow correlated in order to uh, uh, distinguish those novelties. And the, the motivation, again, is based on information theoretic principle. If you just apply, if you have a set of uh, uh, n attributes and you want to identify some uh, class variable y, and you know that in, at each time you add more, more and more attribute to the subspace, and you actually uh, define it by the chain rule uh, and break it by the entropy, what you see is that basically there are two components here that you need to take care of. One is the fact that uh, there will be a maximum orthogonality between those features, and it makes sense because otherwise you're just adding a feature that doesn't add any information uh, to, uh, uh, to the subspace. So it's... Uh, uh, it's, it's not a, a, a feature that you want to add. On the second hand, you want to minimize the expected entropy of uh, uh, the new feature while you have already taken into account all the features that you already picked in this subspace. So basically, uh, what you want to do is to maximize one element to minimize the other, uh, and it is based on uh, um, you know, an information uh, uh, theoretic scheme uh, that works very well with uh, what we call Rocklin uh, distance or the dual distance that actually take care of that. In one way, it takes only features that are well uh, uh, orthogonal to the feature that you selected, while at the same time, it finds those that add enough information or, or the additional con conditional entropy based on the past feature uh, 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 provides a, a new... Uh, a new uh, uh, a new insight into the system. So, Marcelo will, uh, please. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, next, maybe this one. So, the idea is, um, again, I'm Marcelo from Applied Materials. Um, the idea now is to uh, try to find those subspaces in a way that they are built informative information with respect to the correlation, but also that they are split, there can be split among the classes. And it kind of a trade-off. So on one side, we are using um, this mutual information, which 
tries to uh, cope attributes that are correlative. On the other side, we like to split the classes. So if we add correlated attributes, we just will take one part of, or one part of the problem. What we have uh, defined here is kind of a new metric extending the Rochlin distance, which is the uh, multi-attribute distance we call chest, and uh, that take into account how informative the suspect is. And that gives us not only this correlation, this compactness within the subspace, but also it gives us the possibility to minimize this function. And minimizing this function uh, goes opposite to, for example, in the case of feature selection, that you f try to maximize the mutual information. Um, since it's a non-decreasing function, the maximum, it's taking all the attributes altogether. In this case, we are minimizing a function, so there is no threshold, and it runs completely automatically. And, and also, you will find also the attribute, the subspaces that are most correlated within them just enough to give you the best information they can use in order to the, uh, select the, uh, identify the novelties. So small distance means we have a higher mutual information and the idea now is to minimize this, uh, this function by computing the conditional mutual information, sorry, the conditional entropy and also um, a new item which is in the middle which is the multivariate mutual information. This diagram actually was derived from symmetric difference so you will find, uh, um, for those who know that, uh, that uh, you will find actually um, uh, a correlation there. So we change the, uh, the subspace selection through an algorithm that tries on one side to find subspaces that they are correlated, but also inside the subspace we like also to, to split among different classes, right? So. On one side, we construct this, uh, this target function, which we minimize um, in a greedy way, that we will see later. Uh, on, the, on the one side, we look inside the subspace in order to make it compact, which is the first term. On the other side, we take, we borrow the dual information metric and extend, instead of the Rochlin distance, we, ex we extend by using the multi-attribute distance. So the second term, actually, it's the classification term, which tries to separate the, um, the classes among the subspaces. So we have here only three hyperparameters, which is the um, C, if I'm not mistaken about the Greek num, uh, that controls the trade-off between the two, the two terms. Um, also the W1 and W2, which are also the same hyperparameters that you will find in dual information metric. So, um, the way we propose uh, to minimize this algorithm because it's a kind of combinational uh, optimization, it's uh, through uh, a simple algorithm that goes, uh, grows the subspace in an um, agglomerative way. We start first with uh, uh, attributes. This is not a neural network, by the way. It's, uh, all bubbles sim symbolize um, subspace, which is a bunch of attributes together. Um, so we start by minimizing the first um, layer of uh, <laughs> uh, subspaces. All of those are attributes, and by minimizing this function, we can measure the distance, the information distance among subspaces. Um, by using, for example, uh, total correlation, which is another metric that you can also use in order to evaluate amount of information within a subspace, you can't do that because it's not a metric. In this case, we are uh, using a metric that you are actually minimizing through the, the algorithm. Once you have uh, the, the first layer, which is the, or the second layer in this case, S1, 2, S4, with up in this 2, you continue, continue by merging subspaces. But we also add another metric that uh, measure uh, how much information is already inside the subspace. So maybe it's not, a, it doesn't worth to merge merge two subspaces, but just to leave them as they are. So, I will um, go really, really fast. Um, the algorithm, it's actually very simple. You, sorry for the, uh, yeah. Uh, you start by um, initialization, then you find the first two attributes, and then uh, you start using these two attributes and comparing the metric to regarding with adding a new attribute, 
or just leaving the attribute as, uh, aside. Um, yeah, they tell me that I'm running out of time, so I will skip this. And this is just an example of uh, one of the UCR repository data, subspaces three in this case, that we see that how they are split. It's one against all. In blue, it's our target function, our target class, sorry. And in red, in red we see the rest of the classes. So we can build now subspaces uh, in this way and then merging them using an ensemble. Um, we compare the selection against our repository at, at the beginning, and uh, we outperform it ourselves. And also, uh, we benchmarked against uh, other subspace analysis methods that are run actually for one class. Uh, in our case, you can also reconfigure the method to work with single class by putting C uh, to one. And also, we compare, I mean, we put down the M and just the AAG, which is a single class and we also uh, achieve better performance. That means using the class information improves the selection of the subspaces. Um, we, what we have proposed here is um, a way to build ensembles um, based on cards for the normal novelty detection. The way that you can select subspaces is actually not just random, but with uh, uh, insight into the process so you can also later on identify where the problem might, might have happened in order to attack the, that problem and correct the process. Uh, it's a generic approach, actually. Um, doesn't matter what kind of data you get. Um, of course, if there's separation, it's quite better. But I mean, it, you just throw the data into the algorithm and you get just the subspaces and sample. Um, we we also propose a combination of the subspaces to generate uh, um, a threshold in order to detect the, uh, the novelties. And as before, I mean, this algorithm you can also configure to multi-class or to one class. So thank you um, for questions. Yeah.